um, for doing some of the things that we've been doing manually, like uh, linearizing, finding transfer functions, simulating, you know, cl cl finding closed loop responses and things like this. So the name is a bit of a misnomer because definitely this, this thing I'm going to talk about, which is a toolbox in MATLAB called the Control System Toolbox, does do a lot of has a lot of controller design capabilities, but that's not really what I'm talking about today because we really haven't talked enough about controller design to, to, to use those particular pieces, so we'll cover that later. But anyway, I'm going to talk about the tools in the control system toolbox to do things like um, compute responses and find transfer functions, convert back between different model forms. This is a toolbox if you bought the student edition you'll have because um, it comes with the student edition. So I'm going to talk about functions that we have available in here for model analysis. You know, things like converting between a uh, set of differential equations and a transfer function, finding the poles and zeros, checking stability, these kind of things. Talk a little bit about um, linear system simulation, which means how do we go about um, doing simulations in MATLAB. So at this point, you know a couple of ways to do this, but I'll teach you new ways that are really, really fast to do it. Um, and then we might revisit this example on how to do linearization. If there's enough time, we'll probably do it in a quick fashion because this is something I feel is pretty useful and it's not that easy to understand. So I thought maybe I'd go over it a little bit again because I did do it one time, <laughs> but I did it pretty quickly and I'm sure it wasn't that easy to get. Okay, well, that's a lot of information. As you might imagine, I stole this from the MathWorks website. So this tells you all the things that the control system toolbox will do. Okay. It doesn't, this is not all the things, but it's the, the main things that we'd be interested in. Okay. So generically, it provides algorithms and tools, functions, in other words, for analyzing, designing, and tuning. We're going to really focus on the analyzing control systems here. Okay. You can specify the model in terms of a transfer function, which is what we tend to like. It can be state space. That means set of linear differential equations. It could be something else, pole zero gain form. That is not really any different than a transfer function. It's just where it's factored into poles and zeros. It doesn't, it's not really new. Um, so you can convert between different types of models. So you can go from any of the, convert to any of these type of models. So for example, if you have a set of linear differential equations in one command, you can find the transfer function, which is beats doing it by hand, trust me. Also, I'm going to show you something that we haven't really talked about, and that's that if you have a transfer function, you can create a set of differential equations from it, which we haven't discussed. Um, you can also do the lower order approximation. I'm not really going to talk about that here, but you remember we had that one lecture where I wanted to approximate everything as a first order. It was the end of the, one of the lectures, and I said, I'd really like a model that looks like this. So I gave you several methods. One was the Taylor series method, Taylor method. The other one was this um, Skogestad, who I mentioned is a guy from Norway who I know. Um, so that may ring a bell, I don't know. But it gave, I gave you methods to find transfer functions that look like this from kind of arbitrarily complex transfer functions. And so you can do that automatically, even though I won't talk about it today. Um, within MATLAB, you can connect blocks up. Um, so this is MATLAB we're talking about, not Simulink at this point. But you can, in MATLAB itself, you can connect blocks and series and parallel and can do feedback and all these kind of things. This is actually more conveniently done in Simulink, but you can do it in MATLAB as well. There's interactive tools that you can use, um, which means you can do things like compute what the step response is and then interactively change what the, like, the damping coefficient and quickly see how that will affect the response and things like this. It's nice for learning. Okay. Uh, we don't talk about this yet, but we will soon. So you met you know, when we have something like a PID controller, we have tuning parameters, the gain, the integral time, the derivative time. And so far, I've just given values for these things. If I give you a problem, I say the gain is 2, the integral time is 10, and whatever. So eventually, we have to learn how to find these, and that's called tuning. And so it provides tools. I'm going to teach you how to do this kind of uh, uh, manually, but you can do this in, in MATLAB. Um, automatically. It is something called root locus analysis. I'm actually showing you an example of this. It's kind of cool, um, but it's hard to explain now. But it, it has nothing to do with dentistry, so don't worry about it, in case you're thinking that. Um, and then you can look at design or just uh, responses of systems in terms of c 
characteristics such as the rise time overshoot and these things. I'll give you an example of this. So it does a lot. It actually does a lot more than this. And if, you, um, if you're ever interested in what something in MATLAB can do, okay, you can hit, this is never, so you hit help, okay, and then when you type help, it spits out all this stuff, uh, most of which, um, you see, if it has something that says of no table of contents, it means you don't have that particular toolbox that is required installed. But if we look up here somewhere, it's not that easy to find. I'm not going to, okay, I'm not lying to you here. But we see control slash control, and if you could read over here, that says that describes the control system toolbox, which is what we're talking about. So if you click on that thing, then you have to scroll up because it spit a tremendous amount of stuff to the screen. It tells you all the things that you can do within this toolbox, okay? So the point is, if you know how to do something, and I give you an example, you just mimic my example, but if you want to know if a certain toolbox has a new capability, you have to like look through this list and see if it does the kind of thing you're interested in. So for example, if you want to do something called a Bode diagram, which we don't do because that's a frequency response thing, then you would look for something that says, I don't know, frequency response or something? Hey, frequency domain. And then you'd look, oh, it's got a function called Bode. So I mean, it does all kinds of many, many, many. I mean, you can see there's like 100 different functions here. We're going to talk about five or six of them or something. So there's a tremendous amount of things it can do. In any toolbox, you can find out what this thing will do by just typing a command like that. OK, so back to this. OK, so here's some common commands that we'd be interested in using. It's a small subset of all the ones I just showed you. And I've organized them accord according to certain areas or certain functions. So we'd, we'd be interested in creating models and converting them. So in other words, we want to create a transfer function or create a differential equation model and then convert that into another form. You can use these functions here. Okay, TF creates a uh, transfer function. This creates one of these models we don't really care about. This thing creates a state space model. Okay. Um, doesn't really talk about converting between them here, but anyway, I'll show you how to do that. You can, once you have a model, you can calculate this, and it doesn't matter what form you have, okay? You can calculate, it calls DC gain for historical reasons. That means you can calculate the steady state gain of the model. You can calculate the poles of the model, calculate the zeros. You can do something, I'll show you how to do this as a pole zero map. It's kind of cool. It's a little plot of the poles and zeros in the complex plane. Um, you can do linear system simulation, so you can compute what the response is to a step change, which is usually what we do, so that's of great interest to us. Once you do that, you can get the characteristics of that response, like what is the rise time, what is the overshoot, what is the damping, all these kind of things. You can do the same thing for an impulse. Do you guys know what an impulse is? We don't really talk about that. I used to talk about that, but so. All right, so this thing is we call that thing a rectangular pulse. We actually talked about that. Okay? So that's like there's something that happens. I don't know what to call this thing. How about you? <laughs> it's not impressive. Okay. U versus time. And so this is something that occurs temporarily and then goes away. It has some area under here. Okay? An impulse is where you squeeze this thing and then increase the height that way. So you make it infinitely short period, but infinitely large, but it still has like an area of one. It would be something like, do you, when you guys did um, reaction engineering, did you guys look at residence time distributions? So the way you do that is you, like, you put a die or something. It's, it's like an impulse. You put it in there temporarily, like just a, just a shot of die in there, okay? So to compute that, um, you can compute actually the response to any input signal you want, which I'll show you how to do. So you can generate a signal and then simulate it, and then you can extract all the information from that. You can do a potty approximation of a time delay. So there's a ton of things you can do. I'll show you most of these, but not all of these. But these are things that we've covered that I thought would be of interest. Okay. So if you want to, it'd be more interesting and listening to me, you can do all these examples yourself while we talk about them. They're not that complex, obviously. Um, I'll probably do them myself. So this function here creates a transfer function. So what you have to do is specify a denominator polynomial like this, okay? And then you create a, uh, so, sorry, that's a numerator polynomial. This is a denominator polynomial, and then you issue this command. It'll create a transfer function from those two polynomials. So 
For example, if I create, if I say this is the numerator polynomial and this is the denominator polynomial, and then I issue this command, it spits back this thing. So it's created a transfer function with that numerator and that denominator. The way you specify these in terms of coefficients. So, for example, this is s squared, this is s, this is s to the zero, this is s third, s squared, s one. Okay, so you put them in descending order of their powers. And so you can create a transfer function in this way. Once you have a transfer function, then you can issue a command like this. If you want to know what the zeros are of this transfer function, you could um, issue this command. Take my transfer function, please give me the zeros, and it gives you that there's two zeros, they're a complex conjugate pair, okay? Calculate the poles, you can issue this command. This is a third order polynomial, so there's going to be three poles. They all have negative real part. There's one that's complex conjugate pair. So this sy system will be oscillatory. Okay? And it, because this is the, r the zero has a positive real part, the system might exhibit an inverse response. And then you can calculate the gain. Okay? Obviously, I mean, you should be able, I told you if you want to find the gain of a transfer function, you can always just do this. Evaluate the gain of a transfer function is evaluate the transfer function at s equals zero. So obviously for this one, you can, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize this is going to be 1, right, because these coefficients are 1. Sometimes the transfer function looks a lot messier than this, and it's, it's easier maybe just to issue this command to see what the gain is. Okay? Once you have this numerator and denominator, if I wanted to find the roots, I could also just use this command roots. I think you've probably used this. Let me just cheat here a little bit, or a lot. Okay, so it creates the transfer function. So you can also use this command. I think you guys have used this, in, in fact, I know in 361. So once you have a polynomial, you can always do this command roots. It's, it's identical to finding the poles of the transfer function is to find the roots of the denominator polynomial. It's, just, it's the same thing. All right. All right. So those are kind of rudimentary commands that you can use to build a transfer function and analyze it. Um, okay, so what this command does is it says, please take, I, I don't know, do I explain this anywhere? Not really, but anyway, self-explanatory, I guess. It takes a transfer function, g, okay? I've already built the g, right? It's on the previous page. And it creates a state space model from that. That means it's going to create a model that looks like this. This is, I'm not sure what happened in here with the flowers, but I um, hope nobody died. All right, so we know that, so the idea here is if you have a transfer function that looks like this, right? So this transfer function relates this input to this output in the Laplace domain. You can use this command, right? It's called SS for state space, to create a model that looks like this. And when you issue this command, MATLAB will tell you what the A, B, C, and D matrices are. Okay? This will be an equivalent representation in the time domain as this is in the Laplace domain. Okay? Two things to mention about this. First of all, the X's that are, so there, you know, if you were to write this thing out, there's going to be X's, right? So in this particular problem that I'm going to do, we have a third order polynomial. Okay? So I can tell you this is going to create a system of three coupled dif linear differential equations because that's the order of the denominator. Okay? Um, the x's here will have no, usually no physical meaning. Like the u will still have a physical meaning and so will the y, but not the x's. It's just kind of arbitrary. Okay? The other thing is this conversion from, as we've learned, you guys have done this, right? You take a set of linear differential equations and you convert it to a, a transfer function. That's a big theme of what we've done so far. You do this by taking the Laplace transform of those differential equations and rearranging them and all that. Okay. And this is a unique operation, so there's only one answer for any one of these. Okay. 
But going this way, this is not, this is not unique, actually. And I used to teach this in my class a little, a little bit. This is called realization. So someone says, I found a realization. They meant they found a differential equation representation of the transfer function. But th this thing is uh, non-unique, OK? So what I'm telling you is that you can, you can get different answers depending on how you go about finding this. They're all, they all have this. You know, they all have the same input-output behavior. They're identical, but they have a different set of x's, if you will. OK. All right. Oh, and the thing for our problems also is that typically this term will be 0, OK? Because we never have a direct feed through, typically, of the input to the output. It always enters through differential equations, then it affects the output through the state variables. So all right. So I'm just telling you, if you attempted to do this by yourself, you don't even know how to do it, number one. And number two, it wouldn't be unique. And number three, it would be a, f a fair amount of work, potentially. But you can do it in MATLAB in one felt swoop, OK? So I'm issuing this command. G is the transfer function I've already created. I issue this command, and I'm calling the result SS1, just because state space 1, because I guess I'm going to come up with a state space 2 soon, So just so I don't overwrite the result. I shouldn't call it SS, right, because that's the name of a function. That's not a good idea. OK, so issue this command, and boom, OK? It spits out this stuff. And it spits it out, and it looks like this. So what it's telling you is this is the A matrix, OK? This is the first row, second row, third row, columns, OK? And so it has these entries here, because it, it means this is the entry. So the first equation is dx1 dt. Second equation is dx2 dt, dx3 dt. And so this is the coefficient that on the right-hand side for the x1 term. Right, so I mean, just so you know what it means. I'll write out the first equation. So it's telling you, I've created a model of which the first differential equation is this. Is that minus? I'm lazy. So now I'm going to switch to 1 half, because <laughs> I can write 1 half better. At least that's my claim. Okay, so it gave you that equation. That's the first differential equation. It gave you another differential equation that looks like this. Looks like just um, x1 here. Okay, so it's given you what the what the A matrix is. Okay. It also tells you here's the, how the input affects each of these equations. So it's telling you there's no input in the second equation or the third, but there is in the, in the first. So this equation actually is plus u here, plus u, because there's a 1 right there. No u in this equation or the other one that I choose not to write, which I will write. Because what have I got to lose? And it's 1 half, what, x2? So it tell, that's what it's telling you. OK, it says, I've created an equation for your output, right? And um, it looks like this. So I only have one output in my problem and one input, but it still calls it u1 and y1, because usually it has more than one. So it just means the input, the output. So it says, the output of interest to you looks like, what are these numbers? 3 quarters x1 plus, is it, actually it's minus, right? Is this getting too low to see yet? OK. And then it tells you there's no d term. There's no plus u here. So this is the model it gave you. This is the answer. OK. And if you were to take this thing, and take the Laplace transform of all these equations and combine them and eliminate x1, x2, and x3 to get a relationship between y and u, you'd get back the original transfer function, guaranteed. OK? All right. Well, why, why guess? <laughs> you can just do it in MATLAB. So, now you, so this takes a transfer function, creates a state space model. Now you can take that state space model and recreate a transfer function. OK? Obviously, you're not going to go back and forth, back, and this is stupid, right? I'm just illustrating this to you. This just shows you if you had a model that looks like this, you could easily get the transfer function. It would be a lot of work to do it maybe by yourself. So you just take your state space model, 
and then you issue this command called tf, and it cr I called it g1, so I wouldn't confuse it with the g before, and overwrite it. And then it creates the same thing. Well, almost the same thing. It looks a little bit different, right? So if you look at this, you can see it's come up with a transfer function for whatever reason. I don't know what its reasoning is. Um, so that what are these two coefficients instead of being one or one quarter? Okay. So if I divide this equation by top by four and the bottom by four, I'll get the same thing. I don't know exactly why it wants to come up with this form. Seems a little strange. Okay. So you get the idea. You can you can readily convert back and forth. Now, let's see. Do I teach? So let's say you have this A matrix here, and you would like to. I guess I have to issue this command. I probably can't even remember that. All right. Okay, so it's the same thing. Now, um, let's say you wanted to refer to the A matrix, right? It, you can't. You can't do this because it says I don't even know what A is. So y you have to do this. Okay. You see? So it's created an A and a B and a C associated with this SS1. So if you want to refer to the A matrix alone, you have to use this command, not just A. It doesn't know what A is. Okay? And then if you wanted to see, right, if we want to check stability, we know we should check the eigenvalues of this thing. You can issue this command. Okay? And then you could also check the poles of the original transfer function G. What? Don't I have an original transfer function G? Hmm. Didn't I just use this command? <coughs> ah, email. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I used the plural, I think. See, it's called poll, not polls. Okay, so let me go back. They're the same. Okay, remember I made this argument to you. I said the poles of the transfer function are the same thing as the eigenvalues of the differential equations from which they came. We didn't prove that, but you can see, like for this example, it's always true, but it's definitely true for this example. Okay. So if I, if you had the transfer fun, or let's say you had the pole, you had the state space system, you found the eigenvalues, and I said, what were the poles of the transfer function? You'd say the same thing. You wouldn't find the transfer function. Factor the denominator. Find the roots. And you see what I'm saying? Because this is all. This is always true. All right. So, do you guys are you doing? Uh, have you started your design project all yet? In design. Mm -hmm. Is it the AICHE project? When's it due? Do you guys have like updates you have to turn in? Yeah, okay. Case. What? Case. Okay. So do you have like a couple of those before the final report? Is that the idea? Do you guys give presentations of your design reports? Okay. All right. Because usually when design gets intense, it's not good for me. I mean, it's not good for attendance. So I'm hoping you'll keep coming. But I know designs. That's the one class in chemical engineering I really did not enjoy. I'm sure you'll enjoy it a lot better. See, when I did, I'm so old that when I did design, I came up with my whole project, and I realized some people were using Excel. I was doing iterative calculations by hand. That's, I'm 123 years old. Okay, so um, you guys got it easy, assuming you can learn how to use Aspen, which is a, yeah. Are you, are you learning how to use Aspen now? Okay. Does he, is he giving you, like, little problems to solve to learn Aspen? Okay. Are they homeworks? Okay. Okay. All right. Because that, you know, if you look at these computational tools that we use, you know, I've told you this before. Like we're not very organized in how, we, like, you should not see Aspen the last first time in one class and try to use it. It's too complex. But anyway, um, so you guys, I think you should know how to use from Excel from like high school, right? I would think. And then then you see MathCAD, and people like MathCAD because it's so easy. There's no, there's very little overhead in learning it. The the trade-off is there's, in my opinion, very little power to using it. <laughs> So then you go to MATLAB, and you can see this is another level of complexity, right? There's a lot of details here, and it takes you a while. And you have to actually start to write code, right? Like you got to write an M file or MDL file, and the, the you don't, 
you have to learn how to do that. But Aspen, to me, is another level. You don't have to know how to code, but it usually takes a lot of tricks to get it to work, if you know what I mean. You ever had this experience? You code up a column and it says, didn't converge. Have you had this experience yet? <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, what we're pushing toward, this is for your, this is an FYI, is a more integrated approach to computation where you guys buy all the stuff, like when you're freshmen, you're told when you apply here and come here that you're going to need this kind of computer with these software tools, and then people start using these things in the freshman course, right? Because it'd be nice when, if you, when you started doing design, if you had seen Aspen <coughs> before, I think. You saw it in, well, okay, that's mass and energy balances, right? Did you use it in a material way? Yeah. See, because these are, these are the kind of things like, if, you, if we want you to learn reaction kinetics, it's a good thing for us to teach reaction kinetics in multiple <laughs> courses, right? Like, we do it in 361, we do it in control, you take kinetics, you do it in lab, right? That's how you learn, you get exposed over and over again. So just to get like Aspen, I mean, it's tough on you guys, right? You're trying to learn design. You do guys doing economics, right, as part of design? We used to have a two-part design sequence. You know, it was two semesters. And um, so now we condense that all into one semester, and we throw an Aspen in there for kicks, OK? So I hope it all works out for you. I know it's not, I know it's not that easy to, to learn and get to work. OK, that was a sidebar. Now we're moving on. All right, so we just did this. Now we can do something like compute a step response. So how would you normally compute a step response? Well, let's say if it was a homework or an exam, right, you would take your transfer function, you would multiply it by the input, you would try to take the inverse Laplace transform. If it wasn't there, you'd do partial fraction expansion, and it could be a, quite a bit of work for you. Okay, so you don't like that option. What else could you do? Um, well, you could do this in Simulink, right? So we've learned, I think, that um, I know I've taught this. I'm not sure it's been learned. But you can put a little block called transfer function in, my, right? Put the G here in Simulink. Connect this up to a block that's the input, right? You can specify this thing as a step change. You can compute the response. But you know, you have to go in and build this thing, connect it together enter the transfer function, choose the step, blah, 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 right? You can do the same thing directly in MATLAB using this particular um, function right here. So it's called step not surprisingly. And sys is your um, system. It can be a state space system. So I could issue this command with the G, okay? Or I could issue this command with, what did I call that, SS1. Either, it doesn't matter. I can use transfer function, differential equations, whatever, okay? And if you do this, well, I'll show you what happens if you do this. It's thinking. OK. So that's the step response. It's kind of crazy looking, because I picked a weird example to you know, th this is the G, remember it had a second order polynomial in the numerator and third order polynomial in the denominator. So it's a little bit complex. It's oscillatory, as we expected. It also has this inverse response kind of behavior, as we thought it might. Um, it has a gain of one, right? Because we did a unit step change and it ultimately went, started at zero, it went to one. So anyway, computing this by, and plotting this by hand would be quite painful. You can see, as long as you have the transfer function. So in other words, to do this in MATLAB, first of all, you have to create the G. That takes, what, five seconds? maybe 10. Then you have to issue this. This whole thing will be like less than 30 seconds. If you did it by pen and paper, it might take you, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on how good you are at partial fraction expansion. So very convenient. And then once you have done this, then you can look at different characteristics of the, I think this is the command. So it gives you all this characteristic. You remember, these are the things when we talked about second order systems, we introduced most of these concepts, like what was the rise time, settling time, what was the amount of overshoot. So let's see if I can get the, you can't really understand these without the plot. Let's see if I can get that up at the same time. Um, 
Let me see if I can grab and shrink. Well, somewhat successful. I wouldn't call it highly successful, but not too bad. Okay. So like the rise time is, it says is six, you know, about six minutes. So that's the, that's the time at which it first crosses where it ultimately goes. So that's that point there. The settling time, I'm not sure exactly how they define it, but it's probably about plus and minus 5% um, of the final value. So you're trying to get some measure of when it's almost reached steady state. When does it reach steady state infinity? So that's not a very good measure. So you're trying to see when it's close to the final value. That's called the settling time. The settling time is important because if you were to do an experiment on the system, this is about the amount of time you'd have to wait for it to reach a new steady state. So this is how long the experiment would be, you know, maybe 60 minutes or something like this. Um, we talked about the overshoot. So that's the amount above which the response goes beyond this value. So it's about 58%, as you can see there. The undershoot, um, oh, that's actually this value here. It's not that value here. It's the amount that it undershoots back. So the di you know, these are some measure of the damping of the thing. Peak, now that's just the value of that peak. And then the peak time is when that time occurs. So I mean, you can do all this information um, off the graph. So if you were to, so if I were to give you some second order, you might recall that when we talked about second order systems, I told you if you knew something like the period of the oscillation or the amount of overshoot or the damping, you could figure out the, the values of the model parameters, like the squiggly, remember, the damping coefficient and the time constant. So you could get all that information from a plot very readily by using this command to do that kind of analysis. So that's good. Um, so you can simulate, you can do an arbitrary simulation. So this command was called step. That means th the input's already specified. It's a step change of unit magnitude that occurs at time equals zero. No flexibility. With this command, you can choose the input to be anything you want, okay, in principle. So to do this, first of all, you have to generate the signal using this command. And it, these are the kind of things, I don't know if this is the only things that are supported. You can create an arbitrary signal yourself and simulate, but it, this is the standard things it allows you to do. So you could compute the response to a sine, you know, sinusoidal input, a square wave input, which is what I'm about to do, a pulse type input. Um, and so this will return values of the input versus time that you can use in this command. So you issue this command, it'll create these two vectors, then you issue this command, you can simulate for that particular input. Okay? And it tells you down here, all these signals have unit magnitude. So for example, I'm going to do a square wave. So I'm going to use this command just to illustrate what you can do. I'm going to use this thing called GenSig, right? That's this function. The type's going to be square, meaning I want a square wave. And it's going to have a period of 10. So a square wave looks like this, right? Period of 10 means it repeats every 10 time units. I don't know how I came up with seconds. I think it chose seconds. I'm not sure how it knew that. It doesn't know that. <laughs> Did it anyway. Okay. So it repeats every 10 seconds. The amplitude is 1, because it tells you all the things have amplitude 1. And so it's high half the time and low half the time, high, low, switch back and forth like this. Okay? Then you can issue this command. So yeah, you want to put a semicolon here, right? Because I'm not interested in it dumping out a huge list of what the U and T values are. I don't care. But then you can issue this command now that you have the U and T, and it'll automatically create this plot for you. Okay? So there's the output versus time. It also shows you the input versus time. Not